Good evening all. Quick piece of admin. Video quality for the next couple weeks is going to be a bit diminished as my main computer had a bit of an unfortunate encounter with a cup of tea and the motherboard is kaput. So I'm using a backup until I can return to the States and order a new one. Laptops are bizarrely more expensive here and the French use a different keyboard layout that I'm definitely not retraining myself to type on. Originally, I had planned to do all the hypercars in order in which they made it to track, but given that Ferrari just managed to unseat Toyota from Le Mans dominance, I decided to change the order up a bit. Anyway, let's talk Ferrari. Returning to international prototype competition for the first time since 1973, Ferrari returned to Le Mans 50 years subsequent with their new contender, the 499P, unveiled in late 2022. When Ferrari last campaigned a factory prototype at Le Mans, they had more victories at the French track than any other manufacturer, nine victories over 16 years. Now Porsche claims that title, with 19 outright wins over 47 years, followed by Audi with 13 and a half wins over 15 years. I count Bentley's 2003 victory as a joint Audi-Bentley win given the speed dates under underpinnings, the personnel crossover, and its general development path. Nevertheless, Ferrari has had a consistent presence at Le Mans in the GT classes for some decades, and the 499P does indeed share the basis for its engine with the same engine used in the new 296 GT3, extensively modified to strengthen it for its service as a fully stressed component of the chassis in the 499. The engine itself is a highly tuned version of the Tipo F163 twin turbocharged 3 liter V6 first developed for their 296 road car, their first engine of this type. Ferrari opted to use a hot V setup for their turbos, placing them inside the V of the engine block, which helps improve both engine performance and efficiency, as well as decreases the functional footprint of the engine. Power output is reported at 671 horsepower from the engine, transferred to the ground by, surprise of surprises, Michelin tires, double wishbone and pushrod suspension, and a custom-designed X-Track 7-speed sequential transmission. As with the other factory hypercars, the Ferrari is a hybrid, with an electric motor that can deploy up to 268 horsepower to the front wheels at speeds above 75 miles an hour or 120 kph, although the total power of the car at any one time remains limited according to the general hypercar regulations. The hybrid system was developed leveraging experience from Ferrari's Formula One KERS system, but the recovery system, 900 volt storage cell, and electric motor were all purpose-built for the 499P. I'm going to go out on a limb and guess that the battery isn't just a hundred little 9-volt smoke alarm batteries all wired up and stuck in a cardboard box somewhere in the cabin, but I can dream. Learnings from Formula One also informed many of the design choices made in the vehicle's exterior as well. While the chassis was co-developed with and built by Delara, the bodywork was designed entirely in-house at Maranello with strong influence from both the Formula One and road car design teams to ensure both brand fidelity and aerodynamic excellence. Emphasis was placed primarily on optimization for drivability across a broad range of track types, as well as minimizing tire wear, especially given the new-for-this-season lack of tire warmers in the WEC and the elimination of tire, tire formulations for specific teams. Indeed, some similarities can be seen between the 499's front and underbody aero treatments and those found on Formula One machinery, with numerous wings and splitters and tea trays all going about their merry aerodynamic -y business to keep the rubber in effective contact with the road, while the bodywork generally harks back to older Ferrari prototypes as well as Ferrari's current road cars. Before the start of the 2023 WEC season at Sebring, Ferrari undertook at least two private test sessions in Spain and at Sebring, but were circumspect in providing details of the outcomes. However, after a further shakedown during the Sebring prologue a week before the 1,000-mile race, the 499P managed to take first and fourth in qualifying, sandwiching the two Toyotas. Despite fighting heavy tire degradation due to the heat and rough surfaces, the number 50 went on to claim third overall in the race behind the two Toyotas, while the number 51 lost several laps following contact with the 54 Ferrari 488 GTE with about two hours remaining, necessitating the replacement of a rear tire as well as the rear deck. The number 50 would go on to improve its result at the next round of the season at Portimao, taking advantage of issues plaguing the number 7 Toyota to take second place behind the number 8 Toyota and ahead of the number 6 Porsche, while the 51 finished three laps behind after struggling with brake-by-wire issues and generally high brake temperatures, which showed rather dramatically under heavy braking, as seen here. 
Spa saw the number 51 put in the fastest time at qualifying, but a track limits violation caused that time to be deleted, with pole going again to Toyota. With inclement weather at race start, the Ferrari started on wet weather tires and overtook the slickshod Toyota on the first turn after the drop of the green flag. Ferrari's fortunes were indeed ill in Belgium, however, as shortly after leaving the pits with an hour and a half remaining, cold tires caused the number 50 of Antonio Fuoco to lose traction, booping the wall with the 499's port side and leaving him understandably disconsolate. There was a nutmeg of consolation, however, in the number 51's last lap overtake of the number 5 Porsche to again earn a third place finish behind a Toyota 1 2. Then, of course, came Le Mans. Anticipation was high coming in, between it being the centenary of the race and the debut for most of the hypercars. While Porsche and Cadillac had arguably more experience than the other debutantes, due to their concurrent IMSA and WEC programs, Ferrari remained the only team to have challenged Toyota on sheer pace, but for the first time in a half a decade, a Toyota victory was not a guarantee, particularly after some arguably heavy-handed BOP adjustments that added 81 pounds or 37 kilograms of ballast to both Toyotas. The four free practice sessions did indeed bear this out. Toyota was fastest in FP1, but Porsche took top up honors in FP2, and Ferrari managed to get themselves dialed in and lead both FP3 and 4. They managed to further show their pace during qualifying in Hyperpole, with the number 50 car breaking the 3 minute 23 barrier. In Hyperpole, the first time that a vehicle had managed such a pace since the demise of LMP1, and the number 51 the only other vehicle to break the 3 minute 24 mark. The race, on the other hand, was not so much of a walkover for the prancing horse cars. It was far more a race of attrition than had been seen in many years, with only 40 of the 62 starters finishing, the lowest in 11 years, and only 342 laps covered by the winning car, the lowest in 22. Several extended safety car periods combined to a combination, due to a combination of mercurial weather, heavy crashes, and new safety car procedures meant that over three hours of the 24 ran under the safety car. Toyota suffered their first retirement since 2017 after an incident heavily damaged the number 7 car, which came almost concurrently with spiking engine temperatures from the number 8. These temperature spikes required the team to slow their pace until they could pit, costing them the lead, and upon further investigation, the issue was revealed as a piece of Kevlar that had broken off and blocked an air intake following an impact with, of all things, a squirrel. Similarly, the number 50 Ferrari suffered a significant water loss from a hole caused by a small stone, dropping it down the order as well. It was therefore the number 51 that found itself with the lead of the race, and despite a developing starter issue that cost them minutes in their final pit stops, an off from the number 8 counterbalanced that, and the number 51 crossed the line after 24 hours of hard running to clinch Ferrari's first Le Mans victory in 58 years. As for this week's call to action not involving the three sacred words of YouTube, like, comment, subscribe. Why not find or make the time this weekend to take your spouse or otherwise significant other out for a nice dinner? It's early summer. The weather should be nice in most of the northern hemisphere. It's the perfect time to enjoy it. My fiancé and I are spending a few days in Champagne, and much as it would please me to say we're going to Assiette Champenoise one evening and Le Parc Le Créer the next, I was remiss in making reservations. But we do have a plans for a couple of lovely bistros and a lunch at a family-run champagne house in Epernay. Worth a look if you're ever in the area, and let me know if you'd like more details. Have a good evening, everyone.